Uh, we are now going to turn to our panel and our session on orbital, orbital debris remediation, so another collective action problem in the space environment, an existing population of debris objects, an increasing complexity, increasing number of satellites being launched into that existing debris environment, and how do we remediate uh, the debris that we have. So <coughs> this, the, the structure of the session is going to be a little bit different. We are actually going to start off the session with an introductory spotlight talk to kind of dial us in on this challenge, and then we'll proceed there uh, to, uh, to the panel discussion. So our introductory spotlight talk will be delivered by Darren McKnight, who is a, the senior technical fellow at LEO Labs. Uh, prepare yourself for math. So we need to, if we're going to talk about debris remediation, if we're going to talk about the risk in the space environment, we need to have a, a way to describe, to quantify, and to communicate about that risk. And understanding the risk population, understanding the debris population, understanding how we mitigate that, Darren's going to talk us through some of the data and some of the math behind doing that. So Darren, uh, if you are back there, the stage is yours. Right. Welcome Thank to the stage, much. Darren. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. First, I want to thank uh, Secure World Foundation for letting me have the opportunity to tee up um, this group of thought leaders that you're going to hear about, active debris removal, debris remediation in general. Um, but the one thing I want to remind you of is just like what um, Ian said, is I used to be a physics professor, right? And so I'm not afraid of math. And, and I tell you, my job is not to scare you in math, but it's to make complex problems seem simple. Unfortunately, the whole idea about going and doing debris remediation seems to be very complex. It's actually very simple. I'm going to try and give you a few facts um, and built on data um, about why now is the time to do this. Um, we ran a workshop in a summit down in New Zealand in February, and one of the things we did was what are the hurdles to making debris remediation real? And one of the things that we found that was very surprising to me, at least, was we identified one of the main barriers when we looked at diplomatic, legal, programmatic, and economic, that the main issue was the risk of inaction was not compelling, right? We've been doing this for years. We've been worried about this for years. We've been talking about it for years that rocket bodies and non-operational payloads are lingering. Do you realize that in the last 20 years, the amount of mass that's been deposited in low Earth orbit from abandoned rocket bodies has actually gone up? on an annual basis than what it did before that. Despite all the, uh, all the attempts by federal agencies, industry, and academia to encourage people, let people know, it's actually getting worse. So what I'm gonna do is drill down, looking at data. I know you can't read that curve, it's okay. Um, what it shows here is the debris generating potential in low Earth orbit. And this is based on over 700,000 conjunction events monitored by LEO Labs. We do the probability of collision times the mass involved with the objects, with the mass involved being a surrogate for consequence. Thousands of kilograms hitting each other are going to make thousands of trackable fragments. So when you get this, there's actually a distribution above 625 kilometers, because they're worried about the long-lived stuff, over 625 kilometers, be over 25 years. We see these spikes. Well, you can't see where these spikes are, but I'll tell you, they're around 775. Right, 840 kilometers, I'm right now 75 kilometers is where they are. What we often do is we often talk about what's the probability of collision this year to have a couple of rocket bodies collide. The problem is we've actually been running a conjunction experiment since the mid-70s, mid-80s. If I was back there with Donald, Don Kessler and said, we've got these number of rocket bodies up here in 1982, what happens if I roll the dice and go, what's the probability of collision by the year 2024, right? In instead of marginalizing the cumulative concerns, we keep looking at it by year. So let's take a look and see if we run this experiment by rolling the dice from the, the time in which a cluster of dead objects was formed until now. So a little bit of math, I'm really sorry. Um, but what we have here are three different clusters. At 775 kilometers is a region between 700, 700 kilometers, 810 kilometers, with a certain number of objects that are large, dead objects. I cut off at 700 kilograms. Anything less than 700 kilograms, I ignored. And what we looked at is what was the, what was, so there's 145 of those at 775 kilometers, an average mass of 1,500 kilograms, a collision rate 
of around 1 in 543, 0.00184. Don't worry about the numbers. You got that. You can go back to it later. In a minute, we'll get to the punchline, the last column, what the actual number is. So if you take a look at when this cluster of 145 dead objects with an average mass of 1,500 kilograms, 1982, that's the average year of abandonment. So what we did is we did the math and said if you had that collision rate, for that period of time to 2024, what will be the probability of collision by the year 2024? Okay? Did the same thing for these other clusters. Now, what's important here is, oops, let me not do that yet. I won't get the punchline yet. Um, if you look at each of these, have their own problems. 775 kilometers, the average year of abandonment is 1982. That means on average, there's these 145 objects with an average mass of 1,500 kilograms that have been interacting with each other since 1982. I, did a, I, I do this thing called a conjunction of the fortnight, right? It's every two weeks, I tell you, hey, I'm going to scare you with a close approach we had in low Earth orbit. Anybody wants one, let me know. I'll, I'll, I'll add you, put you on the distribution list, OK? But what we found out was if you look at a rocket bite, it was deposited in 1992, the distance it's traveled that swept out over that time is equal to going from the sun to Pluto and back. So it's hard to imagine all that exposure it's had to potential collisions with other objects with very large mass. So 775 started at the earliest. 840, the average mass is 3,200 kilograms. The average mass of that cluster of 91 objects is over 3,000 kilograms. At 975, it's got the most number, and the highest collision rate. Please notice, collision rate is not probability of collision. It's the concern about any of those objects, any of these 350 hitting any of the other 350, right? So it's, it's like the probability of collision squared divided by 2. I told you you're going to get math today. All right, so what's the final answer? That's what you all want to know, right? So the final answer is, <laughs> The final answer is over here. Persistent potential by the year 2024 at 975 is 26% as of today. The probability of collision by 2024 for that composite, if I rolled the dice in 1984, I'm sorry, 1988, which is for, uh, I'm sorry, 1984, yeah, for 975, I rolled the dice to 24, 26% chance of a collision between those two massive objects, all right? And by the way, the amount of debris that would be created would be fairly comparable to the amount of mass involved. So 2,500, roughly 2,500 kilograms would be involved in one of those collision events. So you're looking at probably 3,000 to 4,000 trackable fragments. Okay? This is a concern. At cluster 850, 840, the number now is 6,000 kilograms involved in a typical collision, which would be 10,000 fragments that would likely be created. We've not had a breakup yet that had 10,000 fragments created, right? So these are things that are not one in a million, one in a thousand. These are numbers that actually uh, are measurable with percentage signs. And obviously by year 2039, the number gets worse. So what I want you to walk away with today, I'm going to walk away with an apocalyptic quote. Jeff, this is just for you, right? The global space community is running out of time to gracefully transition from the current world of reliable LEO space operations to an environment where mission lifetimes are routinely curtailed to debris, orbital debris impacts. I am not saying we're going to have the Kessel syndrome, but we do not have to have the Kessel syndrome to have a concern that's going to affect the space economy and something that we should be, have taken responsibility to be proactive to prevent. So again, I applaud Secure World Foundation for getting together the future thought leaders. Hopefully, they're going to solve this problem in the next hour. OK, I hope so. I'll be listening in the back. And uh, I thank you very much for your time and your attention. All right, so does everyone feel uh, a sense of urgency after that conversation? Show of hands, who, who's relaxed? Who thinks we're, we're on top of it when it comes to our delivery? Excellent, nobody. All right, so <clears throat> I would like to introduce our panelists here. So uh, our, our first speaker, our first panelist will be uh, Mr. Chuck Dickey, who is uh, the US partner for Three Country 
trusted broker. And Darren, uh, and Chuck will tell us a little bit about that organization as we get into the and get into the panel here. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Ray Fielding, uh, who is the head of space sustainability at the UK Space Agency. Uh, following Ray, I'm going to uh, introduce. Uh, Iwamoto Aya, who is the Vice President for Policy and Regulations at Astroscale Japan. Uh, next, we will uh, invite Mr. Holger Craig to the stage. Holger, Holger is the Space Safety Program Manager for the European Space Agency. And last, uh, I want to introduce Yamamoto Toru, who is the Team Leader at JAXA for the Commercial Removal of Debris Demonstration CRD2 project. Thank you all. Please join me. All right, so um, as we've done before, we'll have a few introductory questions and then <coughs> we will uh, move to a Q&A session and feel free to uh, submit your questions uh, through the Whova app. Uh, so uh, Yamamoto-san, I want to start with you as, as we're here in Japan and the host country. Uh, JAXA is leading, as mentioned, uh, the commercial removal of debris demonstration CRD2 project. What led JAXA to establish this program and what can you tell us about the ongoing pr progress and its role in, in enabling commercial debris removal in the future? Oh, well, uh, thank you for that very good question. Uh, uh, we, uh, JAXA CRD2, uh, basically uh, want to do, I think, uh, two things. Uh, one is uh, to uh, the acquisition of the space debris removal technology. And also uh, uh, the second one is uh, to boost the boosting of the commercial space activities in Japan. And uh, uh, now uh, I think uh, uh, still uh, uh, active debris removal technology is very difficult, and uh, we have not yet uh, established the technology, and also uh, that thing uh, has been, um, I think, uh, so to say, an uh, obstacle to move uh, the uh, international discussion to proceed to do, actually, the active debris removal, I think. And uh, on the other hand, uh, I think uh, the uh, ADR has quite a good feature uh, because uh, even uh, active debris removal is quite a uh, difficult technology. It has very uh, strong commonality with broad bunch of orbit servicing technologies. And so I think uh, there can be some expectations uh, for, so to say, uh, government initiatives uh, to, uh, yeah, so by promoting uh, the active debris removal uh, technology development, uh, that leads to uh, the commercial uh, on orbits uh, uh, servicing by private sector. Oh, so I think that's a very uh, important point. And also, uh, yeah, you know that uh, uh, our CRD2 project is now ongoing, and uh, currently AstroScale Sands, others J is on orbit and doing on an actual demonstration mission. So, uh, like this. So this is uh, the debris, and the point is this is not the debris that, uh, this is not the upper stage that launched the other stage, but this uh, is the actual space debris that has been in orbit for more than uh, 15 years. And so uh, the, actually this is not the other stage, but uh, this is Hayabusa too, sorry for the details. <laughs> However, uh, so of course, do the proximity operation and observations, but to, uh, not only that, but also this is, so to say, the full range rendezvous and proximity operation. So not only this, but from here to this. So this is very, I think, the point of that demonstration. And uh, 
now uh, the astro scale sounds as J got quite a beautiful uh, photos or movies of space debris. And of course, this information can be uh, very important for the coming phase two. That is, now we are uh, running to start that project actually in the near future, uh, which is going to actually remove that uh, target space debris from its original orbit. And I feel that uh, uh, regarding of the CRD2, uh, it is very uh, so the significant that uh, these kind of things are mainly primary uh, performed, carried out by uh, the private company. JAXA supports the technology uh, for to mitigate the risk, of course. However, uh, mainly uh, primary private sector is carrying out because they're, uh, I think uh, when we actually do the commercial active zero removal, I think uh, uh, that has, I think, uh, not enough uh, market size for the company. So I think uh, that kind of uh, idea of uh, mission should be preferably carried out by uh, the uh, private on orbit servicing company. And so uh, I think our, this our CRT program uh, is now can be very substantial, so to say, providing opportunity uh, for the first step for that, I guess. Hey, thank you. So I think as we get into the panel, a, a couple of things that, that we can pick up there, right? This connection to the on orbit servicing ecosystem, I think, is very interesting in terms of making the the, the technology mature into something that is applicable. Um, and then uh, yesterday we had a, a roundtable discussion on debris remediation that, that some of the panelists spoke about. And in that, one of the themes that came up was the importance of demonstration missions to show the public and to show policymakers that these things can be done. So as yeah, yeah. CRD2 proceeds, that, that aspect I think will be important. Uh, I want to move, move, uh, move along. So uh, Ray, um, Jax is not the only one that's doing a national debris removal mission. Um, the UKSA has made space sustainability a priority focus and has a, a number of initiatives related to active debris removal within uh, the context of, of your team's activities. Uh, given budgetary and political uh, questions, how have you managed to make space sustainability and in particular debris removal a focus within the agency? So we've done it by looking at what the space agency, the UK space agency, is set up to deliver. So it's going to be a bit of a complicated answer, so stay with me. Some of you might have heard the talk yesterday by our CEO, Paul Bates, where he mentioned some of our priorities. And the top priorities are catalyzing investments, growing the economy, and championing in space as well, making sure that the general public understand that space is important, it's, it's relevant, highly relevant for their everyday lives, and it should be considered and cared about. Because, of course, when the general public um, realize how important space is for them, the politicians realize how important space is, and the politicians are the ones who ultimately hold the budgetary strings and decide where the, 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 the money should go. So just on that point there, the, the championing in space points, the mission which we have is, our, is going to be our first national mission. We often work through others. We invest a lot into ESA, the, uh, the um, Clean Space Program, Space Safety Program, along with other investments. And we've done some, some bilateral missions as well, but we've never, as a space agency, done its own national mission. So we, this, we see this really as putting space, the space agency right front and center into the public, big, big presence, big push to get it into people's minds. So it's not only a national mission which will capture people's attention, but it also spreads the message of sustainability. And for those of you who might have seen some of the animations of the concepts for the, uh, the ADR mission, you'll see there's great big Union Jack plastered either on the side or on the front. <laughs> and that, that's uh, like, like three lines on a shirt. It catches people's imaginations. It gets people talking about it. And um, it's um, in, in a way which perhaps no detriment to other satellites, but 
when a satellite actually moves around like an ADR satellite, it's colorful, it's got robotic arms or grabby claws on it. It's, uh, people want to know what it is, what, what's it doing, what, does it, what is this thing? And uh, I went to a, a science fair, a big science fair in London a few months ago, and um, we were almost, apart from when Boston Dynamics turned up with a robot dogs, it's hard to compete against them. But we were one of the centers of attention. People wanted to um, understand what was going on with these models and these animations and the catch the satellite games, which we, we brought along. And that really helps spread that message of sustainability is important to the, the general public. I mean, we know it's important, but we are quite good at talking to ourselves. And outside of our small community, the space sustainability message is not is not well known at all. In fact, one of the end results of that, uh, that science fair was a very little girl about yay big wanted to know why there was space junk. And I said, well, because nobody's been clearing it up. We've just been leaving it. And she said, you are stupid, so <laughs> stupid. Why have you done that? Why have you let this happen? Um, so she was certainly converted that space sustainability is important. Uh, <laughs> the other thing we, we want to do is, is catalyze investments into the UK, grow our sector strength and um, uh, just grow the economy generally. And there is a huge, although this conference is very much focused on space sustainability, there is a huge crossover into IOSM. It's been touched on just now and it was certainly touched on yesterday in the round table. Um, we see IOSM as a real growth sector, uh, hence our heavy investments into the ESA program, which also develops IOSM technology. And this national mission, uh, it was a result of a consultation with industry in 2021, where we, we, we um, consulted and the consensus came back. The best, one of the best ways to grow IOSM sector is to fill in some of the capability gaps which exist in the UK and, and a national mission um, a, a active debris removal mission with all the things that that brings. It brings a, ADR um, capability and you break that down, you then have RPO, CPO, robotics, AI, uh, all the things needed to make a successful mission all grow in technological strength, uh, enable you to do many things, not just an ADR mission, but then other refurbishing missions, um, uh, which, which go along with them, bring in that growth and the, the opportunity as well. So just talking about um, that, that mission, what it actually w will do, it's going to do a few things in parallel. First off, and often negated, it's, it's going to grow the IOSM testing facilities in the UK. And we made some heavy investments in uh, testing facility centers, which you know, weren't up to, um, you know, weren't as good as they, they could have been before. Uh, and again, you have that crossover use. Because we needed to develop the technology for the ADR mission, we can use it for all sorts of other things. It's going to unpick the regulation and make it smoother, we hope. So making the UK an attractive place to operate from, um, rather than going through single regulation um, uh, journeys each time when if, if you can do an ADR mission to de-risk and understand what you need to do in terms of regulating and licensing a mission, that makes it easier to do repeatable missions. And we've got some sandbox work. We're working across governments to, uh, to try, and, try and make it a very, very smooth regulation path going forward. And again, make the UK an attractive place to operate for uh, IOSM ADR operators going forward. And of course, we've got the mission itself. And we've chosen deliberately difficult mission targets. So what we are doing in, for, for mission is we've picked two objects. Both of them are uncontrolled. Um, and, and both of them uh, are not stable. So that the, they're, they're tumbling, uh, they're, they're not controlled. They are UK satellites from many years ago, which can, will stay up uh, for potentially hundreds of years. So that's uh, also an incentive, not only as a technology test bed, but uh, we're removing debris, which could create a problem going forward for, for many future years. And this mission is designed to be fully sustainable and repeatable. So it will grab, uh, an object, uh, a, a client, as it were, remove it um, from, from orbit safely so it's disposed in orbit, then do it all again to show repeatability. It's great doing one shot, but isn't it better to do it twice to give that confidence? And again, going back to my point about we're trying to grow the sector, there's a lot of people just waiting for this technology in the insurance sector, in the finance sector, in the investment center, sector, wanting to know, is it, are these technologies a safe bet? Should they put their money 
into these, these technologies and these companies. So that's part of what we do as government to take that de-risking step, which is very difficult to, to do otherwise. And then the service is designed to return to orbit and be reusable. So again, demonstrating another piece of IOSM technology. And in this case, it's going to be, well, we hope it's going to be refueled to use again. Um, and at the end of its, its mission life, because we've um, signed up to the, the ESA Zero W Charter, we want to be responsible operators. Another part of our remit is to show responsible global leadership. So it would be um, coming home in a safe manner, controlled re-entry, um, not posing any debris threat, leading by example again. So that suite of activity, although important and sustainability is front and centre in our priorities, it brings a whole host of other capabilities and benefits by doing an ADR mission. All right, thank you, Ray. A um, lot there. Hopefully, we can get back to some of that here through the, through the next uh, set, of, set of questions. Um, although I love those images with the Union Jack, like that, that tells you we're coming and we're, we're, we're showing you what we're, what we're doing and that this is important to us, right? That, that, that's, that's a very clear signal. All right, uh, so Aya, um, Astroscale uh, at the global level is performing uh, services for both the UKSA and, and for JAXA and the programs that we just, uh, that we just talked about. After lunch, uh, your CEO, Okada-san, is going to give us a keynote highlighting progress in some of those missions. Uh, but I'm just curious from your standpoint at the uh, kind of working level, what are you learning through those missions about uh, the, the policy? Uh, what are you learning about what is necessary to address the policy and business challenges uh, of making a, a market out of debris remediation? Thank you, Ian. And first of all, thank, I thank the organizer for um, hosting this important event in Tokyo. I'm very happy to join the discussion. And thank you, Ian, for throwing me a very daunting <laughs> question. <laughs> so I try to limit uh, no, try to focusing on uh, what Astroscale Japan is learning from the through CRD2 mission with JAXA. Uh, we call it a trust J mission. And starting off with the policy, um, when we say policy, it's also again it's a very broad, you know, items, and there are many issues like uh, is it about regulation or policy or legal issue, political issue, diplomatic issue? Uh, I can all go all of on. these things. Yeah, yeah, I probably should stop. <laughs> but then, um, if we try to look at the issue, maybe we can simplify to why, what, and how. Why do we need to do ADR? What need to be removed? And then how we should do it. And I know that it's great to hear from Ray that there is a actual project of removing two debris. It's a welcoming progress, but still I think there are not clear stance on when it comes to um, remediation on why part in addition, I mean, there are R&D projects, but still uh, there is no global consensus on who is responsible and what needs to be removed from the orbit. And this issue could be very tricky and sensitive sometimes, so I won't see that in, in soon or future these issues to be solved, but these issues, why and how, I mean, why and what is actually important from business perspective because it would form a basis for uh, future market or create a demand um, that can provide a sort of clarity for uh, business uh, prospects for us. So although these are difficult questions, but I think that some of the discussion, um, the technical data analysis that Darren has uh, just mentioned, I think these data would hopefully to help to accelerate the, this kind of discussion. And moving on to how, how the remediation should be conducted. And I think even if why and what question is difficult, somehow how question, including the actual demonstration of ADR, can progress both how and why and what in all encompassing in a way. And for this one, um, I would like to introduce our Address J1 mission or CRD2 Phase 1 mission because we think it's not only about technology demonstration but also a policy demonstration as well. And we have obtained licensing from both Japan and New Zealand under specific guidelines tailored for on-orbit servicing or ADL. 
that ensure safety of design and operations and transparency of the mission, given the dual use nature of the anonymous servicing or ADR, or unidual terms is the dual purpose. Um, I don't know which one is correct, but then, and also the third one is prevent infringement of the right of the client object. And for transparency measures, both Cabinet Office and Astroscale have disclosed in information of the servicer, servicer spacecraft and the type of on-orbit servicing to be performed, information on the client object, basic orbital parameters of both servicer and the client object, an expected period of RPO, and also SSA organization to be informed of the services ephemeris. That includes Leo Labs, by the way. <laughs> and in this regard, as I said, it's a policy demonstration as well. And we hope that these guidelines will provide a basis for uh, globally shared practices for safe and transparent on onward servicing that will make a smooth uh, on onward servicing and routinize on onward servicing in the future. Having said that, there's still areas need to be uh, worked on in particular, it relates to the global aspect. Uh, for example, there is a lack of legal clarity on involvement of foreign objects or liability issues, or maybe we need to discuss on the future framework for global remediation, I mean, global efforts on remediation. But having said that, there are challenge, uh, progress so far, so hopefully these uh, demonstrations will push uh, the discussion moving forward. And coming to the question of business challenges, um, I would, I think that still the economics of ADR or how to make ADR commercially viable still challenges ahead because many of the space debris existing one falls under the realm of tragedies of commons. Um, so I think there are a lot of work needs to be in that area. Having said that, it's promising that there has been progress on technical demonstration side, as Yamamoto-san has just mentioned, or Ray has mentioned that JAXA, UKSA, and ESA is working on these missions. And we really hope that these ongoing R&D demonstrations will increase the technical reliability, feasibility, and readiness to pave the way for future procurements for our remediation projects. And lastly, I'd like to point out the issue of remediation of space debris needs to be tackled through multidisciplinary or and globally, and also take the multi-stakeholder approach. Um, it is not easy, it's a complex issue, but at the same time, I, in the beginning I mentioned why, why, what, and how. Each are very difficult, but if there's a one progress in one part of the area, I think it would affect the good um, impact on the other areas too, so that the entire issue will go in moving forward in the future. So, with that, I finished. It. Thank you, Aya. Yeah, I, I think policy demonstration, you know, considering that as part of the scope of these initial uh, technology demonstration missions, I think that's a that's a very interesting way to uh, interesting point to bring into this because I think the tendency naturally is to think of you know, the, the UK national mission CRG2 as a technical demonstration program, which it very much clearly is, but these other parts of the ecosystem are, are necessary to, to put together, so thank you for that. Um, Holger, I want, I want to turn to you. So our, our panel here is about remediation. Uh, of course, there's another part of that, and that is mitigation of future debris, right? So we could talk about remediation of the existing objects, but we should also probably not try to not create a, too much additional debris as, as well. Um, ESA has recently announced the, the zero debris charter. Uh, what can you tell us about the goals and progress of this initiative and how it relates to ongoing work by the agency related to re remediation? Yeah, thanks, Ian, um, also for having me on the panel. Um, yeah, so why, why a charter when we already have national laws, guidelines on international level? Um, and that charter is in recognition of the situation we are in, uh, in that the existing laws and guidelines are not sufficiently followed. And uh, being an operator ourselves, ESA is an operator of 28 spacecraft, we know that this is not because of ignorance, it's, it's because of um, the fact that it is technically difficult to do it. Um, retire emission, passivate it, and dispose it safely after five or 10 years of operations is just not built into the designs, uh, if we are honest, of the space system that we are operating today. And therefore this charter, which, which is 
often perceived an ESA charter, but actually it's not. Uh, it's a community document established by several players from international organizations, uh, non-government organizations, industry and space agencies. Um, many of them also in the room. Uh, they, this charter uh, is the response to this. Uh, if you look at the document, it's uh, surprisingly short. It's two pages <laughs> and it's very technical. So uh, it's, it's a non-binding document, but it's in line with the space law and it also is in line with all international guidelines, but it goes beyond. Uh, and it has five very simple principles. And I just highlight one because it fits with the purpose of the panel here, um, that uh, a space object should be removed or should be disposed from space with a 99% success rate. It sounds innocent, uh, but what it actually means is that uh, we know that today's spacecraft, they can't do this, 99%. It actually means that external means need to come in, and we are there with active removal in order to recover when the disposal has, has failed. Um, and that's a charter that has been signed by 12 space agencies, um, uh, 40 international organizations and industry players. And uh, um, if you're ready to, to go for it, uh, the next opportunity to sign is actually at the Clean Space Industrial Days in, uh, in October uh, this year. Um, <clears throat> now, that's non-legally binding. But ESA has decided for itself that we are following um, a zero debris approach in which we make these requirements applicable to our own missions. Not immediately, uh, also the charter doesn't ask to do it immediately, but in 2030, because all what we are talking about here requires technology to be there. We cannot ask requirements that are technically not fulfillable. So we need this technology to mature. And therefore, um, ESA has put it up in several stages. The first stage is already applicable now. Missions that we are developing now will have to carry an active removal interface. And by 2030, those missions developed thereafter will have to be removed by law, uh, mandatorily, uh, so that, uh, that we can fulfill the zero debris goals. And for this, the technology must be there. And I, I really want to stress this. The metal has two sides. One is the policy, the other one is the technology. Mm. Um, and that technology is urgently required. And the space safety program, with the help of the member states of the European Space Agency, allows us to mature technology. Each major platform provider, and also smaller platform providers in, in Europe, can undergo um, a maturation process, robustness process, for more redundancy on board, to be more likely achievable um, mitigation and disposal, passivation. The orbiting kit is under development. Uh, but then, of course, active removal is under development. There's the Clear Space One mission uh, implemented by uh, a consortium, private consortium led by Clear Space uh, Switzerland, removing an ESA own target for simplicity, um, legal simplicity, uh, but also um, in orbit servicing missions are uh, under preparation. We come, uh, we come back to that later. So that must be in place by 2030 for, uh, for the ZODM. And we really hope that the charter, which already documents that there's a willingness of a wider community to move into this more ambitious direction, but it also helps ESA to implement these more ambitious steps. And then for we hope also it inspires other uh, regulators to take uh, similar steps. Yes, thank you. So it's uh, several levels there, right? So it's you know, the, the what can we do as, as action within our own community, but the, the element that it helps us drive this, hopefully build the sense, continue to build the sense of urgency that that we started with as well, so thank you. All right, uh, so I, I do want to come to Chuck now. It's, he's been patiently, patiently waiting. Um, Still here. So one, one of the uh, challenges that we're dealing with is that the majority of objects, as, as much as we like the action from the UK, from, from JAXA and, and from ESA, the majority of the large debris objects are, let's face it, from three historical operators, right? It's from the US objects, their Chinese objects, and their Soviet objects, right? Um, how do we deal with that? How do we how do we work in this complex geopolitical environment to kind of lever to kind of encourage um, these big three countries to, to act? Thanks for the question, and thanks for inviting me. Um, let me start with an answer with a question to all of you. 
Where is Russia at this conference? Where is China? If we really want to get started with action, don't they need to be at the table? I, I was reminded in Darren's remarks about one of his first papers, uh, the top 50 uh, massive derelicts, the most dangerous at the time. I think he's done quite a bit of work since then to refine and, and improve on those analyses. <coughs> but the top 50 paper had three authors from Russia and two authors from China. I think those numbers are correct as, as co-authors. So, I mean, they're obviously, they need to be part of the dialogue. So if we really want to find a way to cooperate, uh, we need to find a way to bring Russia, China, and the U.S. to the table, but also Japan, France, India, and ESA, who are the seven governments who collectively own this problem of these massive derelicts. Brian Whedon and I wrote a paper a couple of years ago for an IAC conference. Uh, Brian is no longer with Secure World Foundation. I say that in jest. Um, <laughs> you never leave Secure World Foundation. Brian, Brian knows that. <laughs> But the point we were collective, the points we were collectively making were that national programs like ones we're hearing about today are very important to get started. And that's true. But the point that I made in the second half of the paper was that we really need to figure out a way to cooperate to actually make a significant reduction in overall risk because that's where that's where the the risk lies um th the other things we can do to move forward i think are a couple important ones for this conference are a couple ideas that i've covered in a couple papers recently for un copious but the first is the idea that industry isn't ready and if anyone seriously believes that industry isn't ready, uh, look at, I would point them to Astroscale's progress over the last several years. I would point them to the recent announcement uh, where SpaceX received a contract to deorbit the ISS at some point in time. I think that's probably, in a broad sense, the mother of all remediation contracts. There are other companies around the world that have similar technologies, but the broader point there is that if you look at the technologies that are being employed today, nations have used those same technologies in furtherance of national defense priorities for a long, long time. Uh, those surely can be used for a commercial or a civil purpose. So we really need to get on with the second piece of the paper Brian and I wrote, which is let's try to find a way to engage the governments that own the problem in the, in the process. Suppose that a, that a neutral procurement agent acting on behalf of cooperating funding governments issued a request for proposal to worldwide industry for a competitive procurement for one or more multi-target remediation missions. That's got to be part of the solution, but that's the only piece that's missing uh, today, cooperation among governments to pursue something like that. There's a timeline point in here as well that we've made in a couple other papers, which is if you start looking at the process by which you ultimately field missions, doesn't matter which government you're talking about, you're talking about a process that will take at least five years to, to work through from identifying targets, from developing a process to award contracts or to award missions, uh, to the terms of those contracts and to all the work that would take planning to do, you're looking at at least five years. Well, Darren pointed out a timeline earlier today that is arguably shorter than a few years. 
uh, if we really want to address the problem, we really have to start finding ways to cooperate. The, the, the other missing piece, I think, um, the other misconception uh, that I hear quite often is that fault-based scenarios for remediation seem to be underlying every formula that I hear for remediation. Well, if we're asking Russia to clean up its own objects, maybe 83% of the objects in this universe are Russian, uh, to make space safer for new commercial projects, we're never going to get there, and I think that's the, the wrong formula. The only viable formula that I think will work is to share cost and risk based on future opportunity in space instead of past fault. That would lead you through the planning process, I think, to a more pro rata approach to sharing of cost and risk, and you might find that the governments would find that palatable as a formula to move forward together and to cooperate. And sharing can take many forms. For example, instead of contributing cost to a mission, it might involve contributing a launch vehicle or providing the opportunity for salvage uh, rights for some of these, these legacy objects. Um, national leadership is fine but we need cooperation more than leadership. So, I'll stop there. We need cooperation more than leadership. I would love to get some reaction to that in, in the break or, or, or now. I am, I'm watching this countdown clock going. We should have scheduled this panel for at least an hour and a half or, because we have, we have so many more issues to get into than, than our time is, is not gonna allow us. So, I have a number of questions here, um, questions about whether some of these technologies could help us deal with uh, upper stage anomalies, Holger, like we saw this, this week with, uh, with, with the Ariane 6. I have a question here about um, how, uh, where a master catalog of debris objects should live in terms of an agency or, or central clearinghouse. I have a, tech, a question about what, tech, what, what is more important for mediation, these big, large derelicts or the, the, the lethal, untrackable objects. Um, so I'm going to throw those out there. Anyone can, can take them on, but I think the question I would like you all to close on in a, in a minute or less here is, how do we make the case to policymakers, to taxpayers, that this technology, this you know, leadership on cooperation is needed? What, it, what is, Ray, how do we answer that, that person you saw at the, at, at the science fair, right? So what can we do to make the case to our policymakers that we need to follow through on this investment? And if you want to touch on any of those other questions in, in your answer, please do. Yeah. I'll, just, uh, I'll start with anybody, but make sure it is over, right? You look like you're here. Yeah. Sure. Um, so it's, it's dual benefits. It's just acting in sustainability area gives you benefits in other area financial benefits, which uh, you know, are very commercially attractive in this sector. I think that's, that's part of the answer. But just to, just to follow on the points which, which Chuck made about the cooperation and that's such an important issue, and we, we always get these mixed up with national and international politics, and maybe as well we should look at some other ways. I mean, the, the idea you put there about a neutral party sending out a neutral tenders, which anybody can apply for, to look at remediation for large objects, I, I, that's, a, that's a brilliant idea, um, but how do we fund that? And there's a, are there any other ways than coming to national governments and saying, put your hand in your pockets, and some of that national money might not stay in your country. Uh, so, and let's say another tender might be awarded by a, a, a non-national player, which then is very, very difficult to justify. But there are potentially other ways. The recent Astra Carta launched by His Majesty the King is non-political. Maybe that could be used to raise international funding in a way which could be used for debris remediation as well. Things which uh, my, my background is earth sustainability, um, Red Plus and other schemes. Is there a debris offset fund which could be set up 
would the, 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 the funds then use for you know, the ideas you, you've just heard uh, to try and, try and remediate some of the debris? So I suppose what I'm saying is there's, there's maybe there's a balance and that would be a lot more palatable than just coming up to taxpayers and say, right, taxpayers have got to pay for everything. Uh, I'd like to explore all options. So Chuck, then I'll go to Holger. Yeah, let me follow on that thought. There's a, there's a, there are all sorts of hurdles to cooperation, and one of them is what you just pointed out. Um, asking national taxpayers to fund remediation of somebody else's objects is going to create an issue. But the answer to it is national interest. If you look at the benefits, it gets back to the point I made about sharing you know, national interest. Uh, everybody has got, every country has a, has a national interest in continuing to use space for its own purposes, national defense, civil, commercial, whatever. And that is the way I think you unlock the sharing potential is because every one of those governments benefits from space. They would all benefit from having a cleaner, less risky space to operate in, not to mention the 190, 186 other governments who would benefit from that in the long run. But in the short term, the seven governments would benefit. Uh, and I think that's, that's the formula to, to use to, to forge cooperative alliances across political boundaries, across adversary boundaries. Yeah. <clears throat> the taxpayer should not be in there forever. This is clear. Um, I think he, he would be required to break the cycle for regulators to wait technology to mature and for um, the market to wait for the rules to come from the regulators. So um, the agencies and uh, many agencies do that through either stepping forward and implementing the technology would break, would break the cycle. And yes, it's a fault-based mechanism, um, but I think it's a good starting point because um, it's the most obvious entry point that you can take because you still have somebody on the hook that is um, that you can actually ask before he implements the mission to already take all the precautions um, and provide insurances um, and whatever you need in order to do that. Um, it's very difficult to do that once the project is done and over. So you can still do that. But I see that only as the entry point. Uh, once this is done and exercised a few times, recurring unit costs go down then I think it's time to think about the old objects that are uh, left behind and that we can then tackle with a more mature te technology and, uh, and lower cost. And after that, the te taxpayer should be out. I have to Me? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so uh, I think uh, uh, still uh, a very significant, uh, so to say, a bottleneck is that technology, I mean, the uh, space debris removal is still, so to say, a future technology mission. And uh, we, we currently uh, do not have a very precise uh, estimates or quotations <laughs> for the space debris removal services. And so I think our, uh, even uh, we would like to talk with, so to say, a taxpayer. I think our, uh, we do not have, so to say, uh, enough information to the for taxpayer to think the balance between the cost and benefits. So how is the cost? <laughs> and so uh, I think currently uh, the uh, bottleneck, I feel that the technology and, uh, uh, however, uh, once I think our, the uh, technology bottleneck has been solved, immediately I think the, the another something will come up as a new bottleneck. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so something like our diplomatic or policy making, rule making, or uh, international cooperation programs or something like that. And so uh, I think that, but uh, uh, yeah. it is extremely difficult to solve uh, that kind of things at the same time in a very large scale, I guess. And so uh, this is actually uh, not the opinion of JAXA, but <laughs> this is, 
my personal opinion that there are, uh, it is more realistic that there to make much a small start. Mm. Actually, uh, as an engineer, I prefer very, so to say, a staged approach to tackle with difficult problems and and part of it yeah. refers to the CRD2, which is two-stage yes. program. And so, for example, just uh, to begin with, uh, okay, so we demonstrated uh, in a single country uh, taking the object of that country by the spacecraft of, from that country. Okay, so then bilateral or trilateral groups will okay, do the same thing. And then let's solve that kind of uh, many other problems in a small group or such. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Very briefly. Very, very quick. Yeah. It, it's important. Uh, I agree with Chuck. It's important to let, e, uh, I think, uh, people to know what is the benefit of the remediation. And at the end of the day, I mean, space is the province of all humankind, and we have to stop being selfish and try to think about everyone and also the everyone in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So. With that, we are, we are a little bit over time, so I, I want to uh, thank the five of you. I want to thank the audience. What, sorry we did not get to the questions. Uh, I'm sure the panelists would be happy to engage over the networking breaks and, and over lunch. So thank you. Uh, we do have one small uh, an announcement session, so please remain in the room for just five more minutes. Uh, I, we have an exciting announcement coming. So uh, for the five of you, thank you, and uh, we'll talk more thank soon. Thank, thank you. you.